Okay. And if you can see a screen that says the neighborhood story banner, virtual unveiling, can someone please unmute themselves or give me a thumbs up? Perfect. Looks good. Awesome. Thank you so much. So again, uh, thank you for uh, coming out, <laughs> even though you're in your homes or wherever you are, for the Neighborhood Story Banner Project and its virtual unveiling. I am Gigi McGraw and I go by the name She's Gigi. And this project was made possible thanks to uh, teaching artist Michael Grant that I received from the Bartow Foundation. And I am very grateful to receive it because not only is it allowing me to present this project now, but it is also something that can extend uh, into the future, which is awesome. All right, so one thing about me is I like to be casual, I like to be comfortable when I'm presenting um, to a group and I'm gonna still do that now, okay? And so what is this project about? Okay, well, uh, it's about hyperlocal histories. And basically hyperlocal histories are those histories in your neighborhoods, in your community that may not be nationally recognized there's something kind of only the people who lived in the neighborhood knew about it, but they still have importance because they share a little bit of the history and the culture of that particular place. Now, the neighborhood story banner, the short summary of it is that I go and I interview people around the city um, and I ask them questions about, you know, their experience in Philadelphia, their favorite sections of Philadelphia people or places or things that used to exist here in the city that are no longer here. Um, and I'm really getting a little sample, a snapshot of people's lives. And I think it's important because 20, 30, 40 years from now, these little testimonies, these documented events will have so much significance so people could find out, you know, how was life like in 2021? How was life in 2022, you know? And I think it's important for us to be able to document those. So the Neighborhood Story Banner does that. And there is a banner that is created that we will see because we are going to unveil it. And um, I try to be as diverse as possible and get a nice cross section of the city. Okay, so hyperlocal histories. It's also a form of community-based archiving. And another name for community-based archiving could be um, uh, community memory projects. So especially if you live in a neighborhood where you have older residents uh, or the community is going through uh, transition, it's a way of documenting those stories about past businesses or people or events that happened that not only affected that individual you're interviewing, but also the community in a whole and you know, preserving that history before it's lost. And one of the things that I noticed in doing research and, and trying to pull up information about communities from you know, even 30 years ago is that some communities are better documented than others. And unfortunately, it's usually black and brown communities that aren't, as, uh, aren't documented as well. Um, and, and that's something that I want to um, start to turn around. And doing these the projects like this, I feel is a way that we can start making sure that those voices are heard, those communities are represented. It's documentation for the future. And I firmly believe that everyone has a story. Um, I've met people who said, oh, nothing exciting never happens to me. I don't have a story and I'm going to push back on that and say no. Everyone has a story. Everyone has an experience. And that's what the Neighborhood Banner Project is about. Hearing those stories and capturing them and documenting them. And here we have the unveiling of the Neighborhood Story Banner. Can I get a ooh ah? <laughs> Thank you. So the neighborhood Ooh, story. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. 
thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So the um, the banner, uh, it has, then I'm going to break it down a little further, but if you look at the image there, you will see that there are 20 images, 20 photos, and each photo represents um, a little bit of culture and history as it relates to Philadelphia. Um, as an artist, I always pull in a bit of my own personal history. Um, I just feel that's the way I operate. You know, I want to know other people's stories, but I also, as a Philadelphian, like to talk about things that happen in my life or how certain um, scenarios or situations that other people are talking about, how I can relate or identify with it. So um, this is the banner. And um, we're going to break it down a little bit more and tell you exactly what's in it. So it's 20 pictures or photos detailing life within a Philadelphia neighborhood or just a Philadelphia experience. Um, I'm taking firsthand accounts. So these are interviews and I'm writing down verbatim what people are sharing with me. Um, it's also, like I said, my own personal accounts of uh, persons, places, or things, you know, if I was there or my um, feelings about things that I've read or learned. It's summaries of news articles or historical journals. So in the case when there's no one that I can talk to who remembers um, a place or an event, um, then I go to, you know, articles, I go to the archives and I pull out that the information that I need. And it's documenting neighborhoods in transition. Many urban city, in many cities across the nation, not just Philadelphia, it's going through major transitions. Um, gentrification and um, rapid uh, population growth, all of that um, causes communities to go through trans transitions. And um, as we will, I will share a little bit as we go further in the presentation, that there are definitely communities here in Philadelphia that do not look the way they did 20 or 30 years ago. And there are some neighborhoods that no longer exist. And so for me, those neighborhoods, the people who used to live in those neighborhoods, I want to capture their stories. I want to remember how it was when they were there. Um, and I have several copies of informational handouts, which will um, be with each banner. So as the banners are set up in different locations across the city, there is going to be a, a pamphlet or a handout that has a summary of all 20 photos. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go on. And this is just a close up of the neighborhood story banner. Um, and again, it's just a visual image and a number. And then there will be a handout that gives a summary. Now I'm going to see how fast I can do this because I can tell that you guys are really itching to know what's on this banner. So I'm going to just really quickly go through the 20, not giving a long summary of all of that, because you'll get to see that hopefully when you go out to you know, see it in person. But just uh, briefly, number one is the bottom, which was a uh, community in West Philadelphia that's kind of not there anymore. Uh, Ted Hall, a uh, merchant in uh, West Philadelphia, Logan Triangle, houses that were sinking into the ground because of it being built on a landfill. Nisi M will tell her story. Richard Allen Projects. Tom uh, Greb of Germantown. The Seventh Ward, which is another community that no longer exists. Um, the African Community Art Forum. We're going to talk about the Friends Protest of Slavery. Uh, Gina Renzi uh, from the Rotunda. We're going to talk about Brewery Town, Sharswood, which is a community that is uh, being gentrified, it's gentrified. Number, uh, number 12 is the King Sesson Neighborhood Gardeners. 13 is Mount Moriah, a cemetery that straddles both Southwest Philadelphia and Yaden in Delaware County, which was closed in 2011. Um, and in that, I share a story about a woman named Paulette Rome. Number 14 is the 1500 block of Belmont Avenue, which at one point had many homes and children and businesses, and now it's been reduced to two houses on the block. 
Uh, number 15 is Sarah F. And we're telling the story of her life. Number 16, the Kensington Harrow, um, Harrowgate community. 17, Loretta Lucy Miller. And she shares a story of one of her experiences, experiences in Philadelphia. Number 18, uh, we talk about the Lombard Street riots in 1824. Number 19, Richard and Henrietta Illy, and that's part of the uh, African-American migration from the South to the North. And number 20, last but not least, um, there's four major street signs in the photo. Willen Avenue, um, which is West Philly, travels through West Philly all the way to North Philly. Uh, excuse me, Willen Avenue, which is Southwest Philadelphia um, in West Philadelphia. Market Street, which travels through West Philadelphia to North Philadelphia. Roosevelt Boulevard that connects the city, that connects other parts of the city to the Northeast, the greater Northeast. And Point Breeze, which is um, South Philadelphia through and through. So um, I wanna tell you a little bit about my inspiration, not only for this project, but um, what kind of sparked my desire to start um, wanting to capture these histories, hyper-local histories, or preserving sort of the culture um, of Philadelphia. Um, my inspiration is a woman by the name of, Char was a woman by the name of Charlotte Fortin Grimke. Um, this picture here is of Charlotte, uh, in 1880 with her infant daughter, Theodora. Um, Charlotte was she, a Philadelphian. She was born here in Philadelphia in 1837, and she was a diarist, meaning that she wrote everything in her diary, all of her experiences as an educator, as an abolitionist, as a first generation or second generation suffragist. Um, you know, she documented it. Uh, she was in the um, Carolina Sea Isles and she was helping newly freed enslaved African Americans, uh, teaching them how to read and, you know, talking about how the fleas were biting them when she would try to go to sleep and how hot it was. And just giving this really visual image of something that happened, you know, before any of us was born. And in, in doing that and in, in having this diary, she was able to preserve um, important parts of history. I wanna share with you a little bit about what she wrote um, as far as why she wanted to start this diary, okay? So she says, a wish to record the passing events of my life, which even if quite unimportant to others, naturally possess great interest to myself, and of which it will be pleasant to have some remembrance has induced me to commence this journal. As simple as that. And so moments in my life um, that I felt had some significance, even if it's unimportant to others, I wanted to document, but I also wanted to document those stories of other people, no matter how small, um, who lived in the community and who you know, remember what once was. So she is an inspiration for me. Um, as an artist. So that brings us to some of the content of the banner. So right here, we have a picture of the Seventh Ward. Um, Seventh Ward was a community, um, the African American, predominantly African American community, community, excuse me, in the late 18th and early 19th century. And it's no longer. Um, if you go to where the seventh ward was located, which is down around like Fourth and Pine and Lombard and in that area, and there's a map and there's a lot of information about the seventh ward, um, you will see that it's you know uh, upper middle class housing. Um, it, it's not as it's not that diverse, uh, but back in the day, it was predominantly African American, and 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 that is what I'm talking about. Um, when I'm stating the disappearance of neighborhoods or even the erasure of neighborhoods, because for a long period of time, nobody really talked about the Seventh Ward. Now, fortunately, a lot of artists, a lot of cultural organizations, they're doing research and they're making it important to say, hey, 
we want to document that this community existed, this neighborhood, these people's stories, um, they existed. Um, and so right here, what we have is a picture of some of the children from the seventh ward. Now this picture was taken after a renovation project by I guess some charitable organizations. You can see in the quarter, corner, um, a woman with a hat on, a Caucasian woman and a man in the back. I'm assuming that they probably had something to do with you know, the charitable uh, situation that went on. Um, the picture that I did not put in this uh, slide was how it looked before. So um, a lot of these homes were falling apart. Um, they were considered slums. No investment from the city at all to upkeep these homes or to make sure that they were safe or sanitary for the people who lived there because they were Black. That's really what it boiled down to. So um, all of the wooden fence that you see behind the children, all of that was in tatters. Um, and it, it looked a mess, you know. So this is an improvement, what you see here, um, of this community back in that time. But then what happens? So that community existed for a, a substantial period of time, but then there was a collapse of an apartment building in 1936 in the seventh ward, which killed seven people and injured dozens. And it became the catalyst for housing reform in Philadelphia's seventh ward. So it took that catastrophe in order to make a change. But what was the change? Was it making sure that the people who were originally there had better housing? We're gonna get into that. Um, before I go on, I just wanna give you a little more backstory about the seventh ward. So it had the largest population of Philadelphia's growing African-American and immigrant, immigrant communities. Um, the ward, furthermore, um, had a rich African American heritage. Um, there, uh, Richard Allen, who uh, abolitionist, uh, preacher, um, activist, uh, associated with the Seventh Ward, James Fortin, who was the grandfather of Charlotte. Fortin Grimke, my inspiration, a wealthy, free, affluent African-American man who had a profitable business as a sale maker. He employed both African-American and white workers at his sale making um, company. Um, and he was all about, you know, human rights. He was about, um, he was an abolitionist. You know, he had money and wealth and he could have easily looked the other way and, and been like, you know, What's going on in the South with those Black people have nothing to do with me, but he was not like that. Um, so James Fortin, Octavius Cato, um, he, recently a statue was um, erected in honor of him and all that he did um, for voter reform and, you know, just being the voice for African Americans, you know, so he was affiliated with the Seventh Ward and also W.E.B. Du Bois, the scholar. His book, The Philadelphia Negro, was based on his observations, his research, him putting his you know, feet to the ground and knocking on people's doors who lived in the Seventh Ward to interview them and to get all of this um, statistical information to create um, that book. So W.E. Du Bois had um, an association with the Seventh Ward, okay? But in 1936, like I said, um, there was an apartment building collapsed, people were um, injured, and that's when the reform for the seventh ward took place. But a lot of that meant displacing the people who lived there. And now again, I said, when you go there, it is not a predominantly African-American community at all. That takes us to Logan, Logan Triangle. These houses, um, were built on a uh, ash landfill. Um, I believe probably in the 1920s, uh, maybe the early 1910s, which could not sustain the, the foundation of these homes. Um, starting out, the community was predominantly Jewish. Um, and then over time, it became um, mostly African-American and Latino. Um, and the houses just started to sink in on themselves where Everybody had to move out. And so when you drive down Roosevelt Boulevard, you will actually see um, just all of this land uh, that's just a vacant lot. 
that's a community, that's a neighborhood that is gone. It's a race. And it's been that way for over 20, 25 years. Um, so the city declared portions of the area blighted and acquired them and set about demolishing large swaths of buildings. Uh, by 1970, the destruction of the Black Bottom, and that's right here. Um, University of Pennsylvania, Drexel University, as their campus campuses started to grow with um, enrollment and student population, they desired a more, um, they desired more land and they wanted it close in proximity to the campus. So of course, the first place they're gonna look is this predominantly black community in West Philadelphia, which was called the bottom. And again, people were displaced, around 5,000 residents, whole neighborhoods full of homes destroyed in order to make way for University City, which is what they call that part of West Philadelphia now. But longtime residents will let you know it ain't nothing but West Philly. Um, but again, a community that has been erased. And then down in the lower left hand side of the slide, we have a photo of Richard Allen projects uh, in North Philadelphia that have been torn down and now they've made like a public housing townhouses. Um, and again, um, all of those uh, buildings. Um, torn down. And even though it was rough and there were some issues in that community, it's still the erasure of that community as it was. So that brings me to a couple of pullouts from the banner that I want to talk to you about. And I'm going to be brief with this. Um, this uh, picture right here is um, number two on the banner. And it is Ted uh, H of West Philadelphia. He uh, is a store owner, um, Babes on 52nd Street in West Philadelphia. Um, and that store has been there since 1972. And just pulling a personal story from me, I remember going down 52nd Street with my cousins when I was like, you know, 10 years, eight, <laughs> eight, nine, 10 years old. And that store was there with the neon light that says Babe. It was always open, it was always there. Um, and, you know, it is still there now. So that's longevity. And to me, that's important because having a successful Black business owner, that's a model, that's something that we want to emulate. We want young people to, you know, follow in the footsteps because unfortunately, um, there aren't that many Black-owned business, Black um, business owners in um, a lot of the communities that are predominantly Black. And that's something that needs to be discussed. And I won't get into all the details as to why that is happening. But Ted H, he says, you have to light your own path and you have to have determination. Um, and he just shared about how the community looked when he was coming in. So he said he was coming in in the 1970s. And around that time, a lot of former, a lot of former Jewish business owners, they were leaving the community. Um, so there were a lot of uh, vacant buildings. And he said, um, and I'm going to quote him right here. He said, um, during that time, because many of the banks were feeling guilty, they offered a program through the Small Business Administration that allowed Black entrepreneurs to have access to entry-level loans. Okay, so that's part of what was going on to kind of like encourage Black ownership. And he said, during that time, there were, there were uh, more Black-owned businesses. There was the Aqua Lounge, and there were other businesses, um, bars and things like that. But he said the bar culture kind of moved into the disco era. And so his hyperlocal stories, his hyperlocal history kind of painted the picture of how 52nd Street in West Philadelphia was when he came in, and also a little bit about how it was before. Next, we have Nisi M, and she's born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, she shares about West and Southwest Philadelphia. Um, she said many of the children from the area that she lived in in um, West Philadelphia went to a school called Lighty Elementary. That school still is there, but it's been renamed to Inquiry Charter School, so it's no longer Lighty. She said, when I was 10, I remember we were given the assignment to write a poem for Thanksgiving. 
My teacher, a white woman in a predominantly black or mixed uh, elementary school, did not believe I wrote my poem and swore that I plagiarized. So I got a low grade. I did not plagiarize. I still remember my poem. In my neighborhood, I used to play with my siblings and younger cousin behind the railhouses in a field next to the railroad tracks. We played two for dare, one, two, three, red light, and foot races. When I was around the age of 12, there was a neighborhood boy named Fabian. He was really active. And you know, when the trains would pass by, he would jump on the top of the roof from a perch, and then he would run the length of the train. Well, one day, he was playing alone, and he slipped when he jumped on the train's roof, and he was immediately killed. That was 1960. These are stories that won't necessarily, you know, make it in anyone's textbook about the history of Philadelphia, but it is still important. Fabian was part of the fabric of that community in that, during that time. And for a young person to lose a friend in that way, it, it affected her, that she remembered it you know, all this years later. These are the stories that I want. These are the stories that are important. And also, if you want to hear Nisi M's Thanksgiving Day poem, <laughs> you can go to YouTube where I will have a video uploaded of her reciting her poem that she still remembers. And it's very cute, I may add, if I may add. Okay. Next image is from uh, image number six on the banner. This is Tom G of Germantown. He was not born in Philadelphia. He was born in Pittsburgh, but he lived here for 50, he's lived here for 53 years. He said uh, um, he was born outside of Harrisburg, not Pittsburgh, Harrisburg. Um, and when he was 24, he was a conscientious objector of the Vietnam War. So that classification under the Selective Service required that he did two years of civilian service for a nonprofit organization. So basically, he came here to Philadelphia because he was like, I'm not fighting in the Vietnam War. And he did um, two years at a place called Germantown Settlement, which I don't believe is there anymore. And um, he said it started out as an in-house program for immigrants in the mid 19th century, teaching them skills like language and domestic arts. And then it, it evolved into a community organization. Now here's when it really gets interesting. He said, when I came here 53 years ago, um, Germantown Settlement, they were fighting the Rittenhouse Bellfield Bypass. Now that was gonna be an automobile thoroughfare to go across Germantown. Um, and it was designed to go from Lincoln Drive to Bellfield Avenue. Now, most streets in Germantown, they run parallel to Germantown Avenue, but this bypass would not, and it required a tearing down of a lot of homes. Now, during this time, um, a lot of homes were vacant. Um, it was largely an African-American community, and they were going to just plow right into that neighborhood, take those houses away, destroy the, the community, erase it, you know, parts of it. In Germantown uh, settlement, they fought. And guess what? Have you ever heard of the Rittenhouse Bellfield bypass? Probably not because it doesn't exist because they won and they were able to save those houses. Um, and now a lot of those houses that were abandoned back then, people live in, people live there and the community is thriving. Yes, Germantown has some issues. There's some challenges as is to be expected in a lot of city neighborhoods, but it's thriving and has a rich heritage And those homes and those buildings were saved. So that's Tom G's story. Okay, um, the next image, and I'm not going through all the images. I just pulled out a few just to give you um, a sample of what people will read about when they look at the handouts, when they look up at the banners. This is slide number 12. This is King Sesson Home Gardens or Home Gardeners. This is in Southwest Philadelphia. So self-sufficiency in the community gardener. Um, 
this is a, a longtime resident of Southwest Philadelphia. Uh, we'll just say her name Miss Claudia. And she says, it is just wonderful. You don't even have to have a lot of land. You can use a container garden and you can still grow plants, tomatoes. So many Philadelphians know that even if you live in a row home in a city, you can grow your own food. You can be free from supermarkets. Um, you can grow the bulk of your fruits and vegetables um, and even flowers. And Miss Claudia, she does all of the above. Uh, she said that um, she has been growing things since she was a small child in Trinidad. Her mother and father, they grew citrus and all kinds of things. So that was something that was instilled in her as a young child. And she brought it all the way here to Southwest Philadelphia, where she is growing like vegetables and sharing, sharing her vegetables with people on the block. Okay, so about community giving. Um, she said when she moved to Southwest Philadelphia, she was so excited to have land in her front yard and backyard to plant things and to put her hands in the rich soil. She said that she likes working with the earth and it makes her happy. And in her hand, she has something called a bitter melon. And um, usually they're quite small, but I don't know. She's all about organic gardening. So she uses like a fish emulsion and some other things, but that was a whopper. So, I mean, she's just really skilled, but she's all about, you know, sharing her flowers, her vegetables. And you'll notice across the city that there are other people like that, um, especially now when people are more aware of just how fragile um, our society is. And, you know, one thing happens and then everybody's in the supermarket wiping everything out. So having self-sufficiency, having the ability to be able to make, uh, to, to grow your own food um, is important. All right, and then the last slide that I'm gonna pull out for you is slide 13. And I told you a little bit about Mount Moriah Cemetery, but um, I came across Mount Moriah Cemetery several years ago. I would drive by it in Southwest Philadelphia and I would look at it and say, oh my goodness, this place looks a mess. It looks like uh, a scene in a horror film. Um, grass overgrown, headstones turned over, wild trees everywhere, abandoned cars in the lot. And I really didn't know what happened to the cemetery. Um, but I always said, I need to find out what's going on. But I didn't want to go in there because it just looked really creepy. Um, and then one day, a couple of years later, I saw two women cleaning up. And uh, one of the women, uh, Paulette Roan, she was the president of a nonprofit that was started by friends and family of people who were buried at Mount Moriah. So what happened was in 2011, um, the cemetery closed. The last rightful owner of Mount Moriah Cemetery, he passed away and there was no one to take his place. And I think his son tried to, you know, supervise it, but he didn't really know what he was doing. And it just fell into disrepair. Um, there was dog fights there, prostitution, drug use. People were actually digging up um, the coffins and stealing things. It was one, one story that I was told that a young boy, he was buried with all of his uh, favorite sports memorabilia and they had put money in his coffin. And people had come and they dug it up and they stole it. And his mother was so distraught. She said that she didn't know what to do. There was nobody to talk to. So she went to Home Depot and she just bought bags of soil and she just tried to cover up her son. I mean, you can imagine her heartbreak, right? So Paulette Roan and some other people was like, enough is enough. You know, there were people coming to bury their loved ones and the gate was closed. They couldn't get in because it was closed down. The city of Philadelphia didn't want to have anything to do with it. So Paulette said she's going to start the Friends of Mount Moriah. She got some other people together. They started cleaning up. The city said, hey, we'll donate some, you know, gear for you to clean up. All right, you're doing this great. You know, started reaching out to universities like the University of Penn, Villanova, getting volunteers to come and have cleanup days. And I asked Paulette, I, one day I said, Paulette, um, why are you so invested in Mount Moriah? What, what was the catalyst for you to kind of like decide to come here and do this? And she said, well, you know, I have family buried here. She said, my husband is buried here. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, oh, where, where is your, your husband buried? Because I knew that I had a cousin buried there, and you know, and I, I wanted to find out where he was, but he didn't have a headstone. 
And Paulette just kind of looked at me and said, um, he's around here, you'll see it one day. Well, I thought that was bizarre, uh, but I wasn't gonna argue, you know, I was like, why won't you just show me where her husband's buried? Um, anyway, throughout the years, I, I wrote a play about Mount Moriah with the hopes that universities would pick it up. It could be a fundraiser. And I wrote stories about people who were buried there from the past and people who were buried there, you know, in 2011 when the gates closed. And um, Paulette allowed me to do it. And we had the show right there in the cemetery. And um, it was it, it's called Stories of Grave Importance. So from time to time, I would check in with Paulette, I would volunteer, but of course we get busy and I wasn't always calling her, but you know, whenever I did, she would answer. She took me on scenic drives. She was so proud of the cemetery. She told me about plants that she had planted and new trees that were there and trees that they needed to cut down. And don't you ever plant a rose bush in a, a cemetery because it'll last for hundreds of years and it'll push up the headstone. Like all of this information I was given. So I called her in the winter of 2019, around February, because I wanted to do another project. And she didn't call me back. And I was kind of irritated by that. Why won't you call me back? I call her again, she does it. So anyway, I was like, all right, fine. When she's ready to talk to me, she'll call me. Maybe in March, April, I say, eh, let me call again. Uh, this time, the phone is answered. Hi, Paulette, it's Gigi. This isn't Paulette. Who is it? This is her grandson. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Is Paulette around? Paulette passed away in February of 2019. She had passed away. I was devastated. I was devastated because here was this woman full of stories and preserving, you know, the cemetery and, and, and making sure that, you know, the people who were buried there, that there was dignity in their burial when she had passed away and I hadn't even spoken to her. So I said, uh, okay, I'm gonna go to the cemetery and I'm gonna look for her headstone. And I looked and I looked and I looked and there was a butterfly there that was hovering over my head and I won't get into all of that. But long story short, I saw a headstone that said, Rome and it was her husband's headstone. And then I saw that her name was added underneath of it because even though the cemetery was officially closed and no more burials were allowed to take, was allowed to take place, because she had been um, such um, uh, advocate for Mount Moriah, she had done so much for it that they allowed her to be buried there. And I thought to myself, you know what? She was right. One day I would know where her husband was buried. I just didn't know that it meant I wouldn't see her anymore. But this is a story that I want to document because she was important. Her efforts were important. And for those people, those future preservationists who come to Mount Moriah and do work, it's important to know what she started. And so I have a marker there so I can always remember where to go when I want to visit. Okay. So moving on, I, I want to share. Um, so the banner, um, standing alone, it has wonderful photos, but again, there's um, accompanying uh, documentation that goes with it. Okay. So we have something called the neighborhood story banner poster. This poster is going to be uh, placed in one of the communities uh, that we are documenting. And the idea is everyone will, uh, anyone who wants to can add to it. They can write um, a story, a little testimony. They can draw a picture. They can put a poem, whatever they want. They can add, they can draw, write, or share. So this paper poster will be in a location near um, a neighborhood story banner so that the conversation can continue. So we have those and they'll go into five different locations. And then uh, on, the, on the slide, on the right-hand side, you will notice the information summaries handout. So it gives sort of an overview of each photo, much like I did with some of the things that I pulled out. Um, 
but it gives a little more detail. And it always refers people back to uh, the website or the YouTube channel. So that's a company documentation. So you saw the picture of the banner. Um, there's another part to this project that I want to talk about. So I purposely left a space open at the bottom of each banner. Um, and so you can see how it looks with our community artwork because I wanted to allow um, people in the community to add artwork that is reflective of that particular community where the banner will be housed, you know, for whatever period of time. Now, this is a mock-up um, using Germantown. And in the center, there's a picture of the Johnson House, which um, is a historic home in Germantown. Um, it was built in um, the mid-1700s, the Johnson family. They were Quakers and abolitionists. And it was also an underground railroad station. So I felt like that needed to be smack dab in the middle because it just speaks so clearly about the history and the culture and the heritage of Germantown. Um, so this is a mock-up, but each banner will have images, artwork that um, captures the spirit of that particular neighborhood. So this is Germantown, but North Philadelphia will have one, West Philadelphia will have one. And North Philadelphia is one of the communities, another community um, that's part of this, uh, the display. Germantown, as I said before, which is Northwest Philadelphia. West Philadelphia will have a banner. Southwest Philadelphia will have a banner and South Philadelphia. Now, where will these banners live? Thank you for asking that question. So the banner frame, uh, so each banner has a, a banner holder. The banner holder is sort of lightweight material, so it would be easily knocked over if it was outside. And so I thought it would be important to find a local social place where the banner can exist inside. Um, and some of the areas where there's high foot traffic, you know, a lot of people there for whatever reason, it would be great to have this banner house there. So like coffee shop bookstores, like Amalgam Comics in, um, what is that? Fair, not Fair Hill. Uh, oh my goodness, I can't think of the, it'll come to me after this is over, but it's sort of closer to um, Spring Garden Street and uh, Northern Liberties. Yeah, around Northern Liberties, Fishtown. Fishtown, there we go. Thank you, Brain. Fishtown area, black owned store, um, house museums like the Edgar Allan Poe Museum, like maybe in their lobby area or the Colored Girls Museum um, in Germantown. Um, churches, especially churches that have, um, that's, you know, dedicated to uh, social service, um, in-service uh, community organizations, community organizing, excuse me. Um, I thought that the banner would be really great to maybe house that in one of their multi-purpose rooms. Um, clinic offices, WIC offices, doctor offices, you know, in the community, um, good place to have this neighborhood story banner, um, recreation centers, and also public libraries. All of those venues, I think, are wonderful places that these banners can live. And there's five banners, and it'll be different parts of the city, but these are some of the areas, and also cultural organizations. Um, that's where I'm intending for these to live. Now, the beauty of this is today is the virtual unveiling of this project. And this project has launched in 2021. But the beauty of this project is that it can last throughout the years, either go into 2022. And that's what I'm looking. I'm not looking to just have this be a one and done. My hope is that this is something that will continue and that more stories can be added. That brings us to our YouTube channel. So we have the banner, we have the documents that accompany it, but we also have a YouTube channel where I've interviewed uh, different people. Some of the people that I've interviewed, um, they're displayed on the banner, um, but some are not. And these are hyper-local hyper stories. 
from people who live in or near uh, or work in Philadelphia. So right now I wanna share a little um, YouTube video of one of my interviewees, this Loretta Lucy Miller, and she's sharing her stories. So I'm gonna share my computer screen so you can see this YouTube video here. So let's just hold on and see what's what. Give me just a second here. If you can see a picture of Loretta, can somebody give me a thumbs up or say, I see it? I see it. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to get started. Hi, I'm Loretta Lisa Miller, and I was born in Cook General Mercy Hospital in the East Lansdowne on June 23rd, 1948. And I'm from a family of 11, nine girls and two boys. We lived in the suburb of Philadelphia, New Orleans. And when I got older, one of my favorite things was my mother would just take me all by myself on the train, but on the Orton train. And then we would go to Philadelphia to the railroad station. Then we would get off and we would go to three parties. Ah, we so great. We put the nickel or the whatever it was in there and we get crab cakes uh, with tomatoes on top, mashed potatoes, and a big Kaiser roll with a pat of butter. And it was just my mommy and me. And we would sit there and eat it. And I felt so much. That was a special place for us. Later on, I found out she took me to the tent. So anyway, then at Christmas time, she would take my sisters, I have two twin sisters, two years older than me. We would go to Wanamaker's and we would go see Santa Claus and then we would go to the Crystal Room. Uh, I'm stopping this real quick. Can you see the image of Loretta or just hear the audio? Just hear the audio. We, oh, saw the, we see the picture, but not the video. Okay, so let's see if I can switch that around. You know what? For the sake of time, let's let's be good with the audio. And then, hey, how about after this, you guys can go to the YouTube channel and you can actually see it. But I'll just continue. Can you hear it well? Yes. Okay, thank you. And in the crystal room, we would have two sandwiches. And it was magical. We had crystal chandelier. It was just so great. And I think, oh, I also had a pot pie there. And so the Philadelphia, that that is just like home to me. That's my special place. Yeah. And it reminds me of my mom. And that's very special to me. And that's all about love. That was love, love, love. And as I got older, I took uh, my daughter there to the crystal room. And, um, it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. Okay, the community that I was talking about was, is, um, well, when I got older, I became an actress with the German Town Theater Guild. And that was the first time that I was in an interracial company. And I really had not had experience with people of color until that time. And uh, I, uh, it is so wonderful. It is so wonderful that these people different from me, who look like me, and have different, they just, they were different from their own. And, uh, and it was just so great. And the German town people go, I mean, that was the place we go. We had shows there. And Kitty Meinhardt was in charge of it. We toured all around Philadelphia. And at, at her place was you go through a fence on Logan and Germantown Avenue. It was beautiful. And the theater was back there, and it was just lovely. 
And when I came back, I did move to Atlanta for 11 years, but when I came back in 2009, I wanted to go back there and see what was going on. No, it, it was dilapidated, it boarded up, and it was not the same. And that was sad. But I uh, always have fine memories of her and my time there. Okay. I love the art museum. As a matter of fact, when I got die, my some of my ashes and my grandchildren and my children know that my, some of my ashes are going to be strewn in fact of the Rocky statue. Where there's a guard back there. Because I want to be where the action is. I have pictures of me taken years ago when Rocky came up. I was at the top of the steps and he was there. And then I have pictures of my children, and then I have my grandchildren. We have pictures of them here. So that was very special. I love the art museum. I've seen it so many times. I am a member every year. And um, uh, it's just the most magical place in the world and area. And uh, just, I remember when I was, I guess, 18, I had my first real boyfriend. Uh, we went there, we had a little awesome feeling when we drove in the park, but then it was nighttime and we didn't know what's around. So and we were lying somewhere on the stove looking up at the top, and I thought, this, well, it was a different world to me. So that is my favorite, favorite part. Okay, thank you, Loretta. Okay, if everyone can see the um, the slideshow again, can I get a thumbs up? Oh, yes. Okay, perfect. So that's just a sample of some of the, um, the stories, the hyperlocal stories or the stories that people share, but in that you learn so much and you also see how communities change or how experiences in these neighborhoods affected someone's life you know, in a positive way, or sometimes in a negative way, but it all matters. So, social media contacts. Um, this is sort of the website, um, she'sgg.wordpress.com, where I have information about the Neighborhood Story Banner Project, as well as other upcoming projects. Um, my Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, um, all of this, I'm updating it with um, new interviews and other things that I'm doing around um, community memory projects and uh, hyper-local histories. Um, and then the YouTube channel, that's the link there, but don't worry, you can always email me at shegg910 at gmail.com. That's she gg910 at gmail.com. You can always email me and I'll send you a link and I'll let you know whatever you want to know. And my phone number right there. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for uh, attending the unveiling, but we're not done. So don't go anywhere. Um, the neighborhood story banner this December 13th, 2021. And guess what? A physical banner will be coming to a location near you and again i am Gigi, or she's Gigi. so thank you so much now i am going to open up the discussion for questions all right so let me stop this share here hey Gigi, wonderful job Beautiful. thank you everybody now can you see my face now <laughs> hey Georgina. Hi. Hey. <laughs> hey, you can all see my face now, right? Right. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, so that is the unveiling. Thank you. I'm sure there's things that I left out, but hey, at this time, are there any questions or suggestions or comments? And it's 7:55, so we're doing pretty good on time, right? Yes, you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I have a question. I have a question, Gigi. How did you pick like which places you were going to focus on did you have any way that it kind of evolved into that that place yes thank you so i really wanted to make sure that i went across the city um i live in a certain section of philadelphia uh, southwest philadelphia and um 
right on the border of West Philadelphia. So it was important for me that I didn't just put all of my focus on those two areas. Um, all throughout my uh, artist career, and even as a person who um, does community um, engagement, I always would travel to different sections of Philadelphia. And I was always intrigued by the stories of a culture within a, a, um, a neighborhood that might just be a couple of miles from where I live. It's a whole different like feel. Um, so I picked the neighborhoods knowing that I wanted to go north, south, you know, northwest, southwest, you know, um, west. I wanted to make sure, and I wanted to also go um, northeast, but due to um, time and then with coronavirus, my contacts in northeast of Philadelphia, um, they had to cancel. They were getting ready to have like a big history fair. Um, I have a connection with um, northeast Philadelphia. Um, historical group. Anyway, they were going to have like this big uh, history fair in September, but it had to be canceled. So I said, well, Northeast Philadelphia will be for the future. But in the 20th photo on the banner, I have the street sign for Roosevelt Boulevard. So that's sort of like me paying homage to that part of Philadelphia, which in the, in the truth of, you know, the history of Philadelphia, Northeast Philadelphia is the newest, the newer part of Philadelphia because um, it was uh, farmland and, you know, back in the day. Um, and, you know, so that's that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, any other questions? And uh, are, Gigi, are you looking for places to put the banner in Is or do you have any? I'm definitely looking for places to put the banner. Um, I reached out to a coffee shop bookstore in a uh, black owned coffee shop bookstore in Germantown. Um, I haven't gotten any follow up on that. Um, the thing about the banner though, is that it's weatherproof. It can go outside, but for, because we're gonna be adding artistic embellishments on it and because the banner holders are sort of of this lightweight material, I thought it'd be better that it'd be housed indoors. And I thought it would make a nice sort of like conversation piece in um, indoor spaces that I kind of mentioned. So if you know of any places, let me know. I was thinking of Art Street Meeting House, but um, oh, just the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I'm writing that down. Any other questions or suggestions or anything? <laughs> Okay, that was easy. Um, so once again, um, you can always email me, um, shegg910 at gmail.com. Uh, I'll be more than happy to share sort of the evolution of this project. And again, I wanna thank the Bartow Foundation for the micro grant. I mean, um, it allowed me to get this started and this has been uh, one of my many passion projects or pieces that I've been interested in. Um, and I guess that concludes the unveiling. So thank you. And it is 7.59. So I think we did really good on time. Gigi. Yes. Um, oh, I had a question and it's gone. Hopefully it'll come back. That happens to me all the time. Well, oh, oh, this... This was an incredible project. It, it looks mm -hmm. like it's it, it's so time consuming. How much time do you spend on? Did you spend on this? <laughs> a lot of time. Uh, yeah. So it, it it does. It takes a lot of time because you have to do the research. Then to write out like the document that was like writing out a college uh, paper <laughs> that you know that I thought I was done with those days, but not. And then you want to make sure that it's. Right, so you have to get it edited. Um, and fortunately, I work with a, a wonderful woman um, by the name of Direct, and she helps me with that. Then I wanted to have the website, so I have to make sure that the website is up and running. And see, um, Mr. Uh, Ted from Babe, he said you have to light your own path. And I, I get what he's saying because I never really considered myself like um, tech savvy or, or knew a lot about computers, but. Um, when you want to get something done, you will find a way. And if you can't find a person to do it, my motto is, and you do it yourself. And so I had to learn all of this because I wanted to make sure that, 
you know, this project lives and other sort of um, projects around preserving these histories that, you know, that they have a place to go. Um, like I said, with uh, Charlotte's uh, Fortune Grimke's uh, diary, just by her documenting things that happened in her life, I mean, that's helped us out so much about learning, learning about things that uh, were really pivotal moments in this nation's history. And, you know, when I think of communities that used to exist here in Philadelphia and they're gone, and then I look to see if there's any kind of historical marker or cultural marker or anything, you know, like on 52nd Street, there was a jazz lounge, uh, lounge called the Aqua Lounge. And like Dizzy Gillespie, um, all the heavy hitters in jazz, they perform there right here in West Philadelphia. And there's no marker and there's very little information about it. And the people who went there, they're getting up in age. And I think it's important to document those histories we wanna know. And so I'm trying to do that. Uh, Gigi, there are a lot of people that do the history of the music in Philadelphia, but uh, the way that you approach it, I think you could give it a different twist with the personal interviews and the recollections. Thank you. Thank you. That's what, that's what I try to do, you know. So it is now officially 8.02 p.m. and we've done an hour and two minutes. Um, so I release you. <laughs> um, but Gigi, I have a question. One uh -huh. question. Uh, do you have a PayPal account in case people wanted to make donations? To you? I do have a PayPal account and I can share that information with anyone who's interested. You can um, send me a message in the chat and I'll, I'll, um, I'll send that your way. I, I don't know it by heart. <laughs> That's bad, but I definitely will um, send that to you. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll send you a text, Gigi. You, you know. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to commend you on this. This is yeah. amazing. <laughs> and you told me a little bit along the way what you were doing and what this mini grant of, was allowing you to do. And just like, um, you know, the other person, just the work that you put into it. And, um, but your vision, I think is so amazing and wonderful how you mix the personal histories with the city with historical and present and ancestors and living and I, you know, I just started following your YouTube P, uh, channel and just these interviews. I mean, just everyday people um, having these extraordinary stories and histories of their own that link up and thread through the city. And I think that is, um, you know, really personalizing the city's history, I guess. And that this is so unique. Um, and you are the perfect person to do it and you are doing it phenomenally. And so, yeah, let people donate to you and pay you and support you because this is a huge undertaking and, you know, Philadelphia needs you. And I think it really will be like a prototype. I put it in the chat for other cities and towns, you know, when people pass, you know, just like Rio's, just like, you know, with people being the repositories of these histories when they pass and it's not documented in any kind of way, it's lost. And you said that. And so you doing this work is amazing and it can be copied, you know, replicated in other places, but thank you. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for that. And I appreciate you being here. Um, you know, I'll end with it. I mean, if, of course, if there's other questions. I have one more thing before you end. Uh-huh. So uh, Gigi did her one woman show about her life uh, we recorded it at old academy in january and hopefully this march the end of march she will be doing it live um on a saturday and a sunday so i hope that you'll all come and support Gigi. and Thank so because she's marvelous she's amazing i don't know how she does all this i don't mm -hmm. know i just don't know I, but mm -hmm. it's God given. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I, I thank you, and yes, and um, directed by Miss Loretta Lucy Miller. Um, but I, I want to say, you know, um, one of the things I, I have friends that I feel are very um, they're activists and, and they do a lot um, uh, around social justice or you know things that are important to them, and I always kind of admired that. But I also knew the type of person that I was, and maybe I'm not the person who's going to um, 
march at a, a protest rally, but I have strong feelings and, and I believe in things. And I wanted to find out for most of my life, how can I, how can I do something that can benefit the community, but also be true to who I am in my nature and, and the things that I enjoy. And I've always enjoyed interviewing people and hearing their stories from even as a child, I interviewed my great grandmother and my grandmother. And so I feel like by preserving and documenting these stories, in a sense, this is my form of activism. This is my way of saying these stories mattered, these communities matter, these people, you know, they existed and, and they contributed to the city that we know and into history. And so that's why I want to do it. And so thank you. And we're glad you do. Mm -hmm. Yay. Okay. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're, we're done. I'm going to stick around, you know, just in case there's anybody who, you know, want to talk afterwards, but I'm going to get ready to turn off the recording. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to go, but Gigi, can you just send out your PayPal information to everybody that was on the list for tonight uh, yeah. uh, saying it was requested? Absolutely. Uh, you do that? Can you do that? Yes, I, I will do that. I, uh, you know, I'm gonna do that. Okay, um, do it soon, honey. Do it soon. All right, all right. You I know, I, you. I'm still yeah. learning everything. I, I told you, I'm still, I'm still figuring things out. But <laughs> I'm gonna do it for sure. Oh, you're doing great. You're okay. just great. We think you're great. You're doing Have awesome. Wonderful. Bye, bye, Shani. Is it bye, Shani? bye. Nice Shani. to see you, Shani. Yep, yep. Yes, nice.